Uh, hello, everybody. Um, so, yeah, welcome to the, the second half of the second day. Uh, I'm not supposed to normally play favorites, but I'll just say this panel is one of my favorites. Um, <laughs> Um, the, the reason why, I mean, as an organization, you know, serving our community, uh, one of the most critical things is, is um, you know, elevating the, the quality of our lives. I think we spend a lot of energy, you know, on that, on that topic and um, on this voyage we all share, you know, in all our different roles. And um, you know what this what this panel is about, and you know this is sort of you know Amos. You'll, you'll meet them all in a second. The, his vision really um, is about starting to uh, to propagate the the positive practices and the the best of us as a model for uh, for individuals and for studios and for entrepreneurs um, and for for large successful organizations as well. So this panel is um, creating high performance cultures. Um, we have joining us our um, Carrie from the Chief People Officer of Insomniac Games, um, Lynn, the Director of Human Resources and Operations at Heavy Iron Studios, uh, Paula, who is the Executive Director of Human Resources and Admin Operations at Next in America, and Amos, who heads up our HR SIG and is also the co-founder and COO of Hidden Variable Studios. Um, so. I'm let all of you just introduce yourselves and talk about your roles and, and how long you've been a senior HR executive and uh, independent or not, and, and just the size of your companies, how they're different. We'll start right here. Okay. Is my, okay, my mic is working. Hi, everyone. Um, again, I'm Carrie Dieterle. I'm with Insomniac Games. I have been with Insomniac Games for, oh, just over eight years, um, and in the entertainment industry for, oh, <laughs> Longer than that. Um, <laughs> um, when I came to Insomniac Games, uh, we had about 65 employees. We're an independent developer, most well known for the first three Spyro the Dragon uh, games, as well as the Ratchet and Clank franchise and Resistance Fall of Man. So over time, we've grown um, considerably in size from those 65 employees um, to just over 200 and two locations now. Um, I think that, you know, for me and, and, and what I want to share with you all today is really about sort of the transition of Insomniac from a, from a smaller developer into that mid-sized developer and, and how we focus uh, so much of our efforts on our employees and the culture that we're creating um, in addition to the games that we make. So. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Amos Marvel. I am currently the um, co-founder and COO of Hidden Variable Studios. I have also been in the entertainment business uh, for about a decade. I've been in games for about seven years, and my first start uh, in the games industry was at Insomniac Games. Um, and uh, I've worked for uh, Insomniac, Liquid, Spark, a variety of different developers, and uh, in having the opportunity to start our own studio, um, I feel like I bring a pretty fresh perspective of not having the legacy information that you sometimes have um, when you inherit a studio as a senior HR executive. And um, certainly I think we have, you know, we're a lot more nimble. We can make a lot of changes because we are very small. And so um, I'd love to share that with you this afternoon and have you have some great takeaways. Good afternoon. My name is Lynn Eaton. I'm the Director of Human Resources and Operations at Heavy Iron Studios. And I'm coming up on 10 years in the video game industry. And in my other life, I was in the staffing industry so and in human resources. So there was a nice segue into being a human resources executive and being responsible for supporting an organization. So the first seven years or so I spent at Vivendi Games, which became Activision Blizzard and the last three years, so I had the, the opportunity to build up the organization at Vivendi and participate in that, and then to close it. So that was lots of fun three years ago. Um, but there are processes and experiences that we learn about our function going through those processes as well. Then I came to THQ and was hired by them to oversee four studios, the human resources uh, responsibility for four studios, and then big changes happened at THQ. So in 2009, Heavy Iron Studios had the opportunity to take 
our studio private, and we separated from THQ as the parent company. So I think the most significant uh, and experience and things that I can share with you today are about transitioning from a global publisher to an independent developer and having to create everything. The infrastructure, the culture, the team, the processes, everything. Because when we left THQ, all of that infrastructure was left behind. So it's been a great experience and we are enjoying great success. So I'm really happy to be here and share with you. So I'm Paula Thalbaum. I have a cold, so I'm going to apologize if uh, my voice sounds a little bit odd. Um, my, I have about 13 years in the entertainment industry. My early career was in film and television animation with uh, Mainframe Entertainment back in the reboot days, if anybody's familiar with that. Um, my um, gaming career was with Relic. And uh, that was part of the THQ por portfolio. So when, I, when we were acquired by THQ, I moved into my HR role with them, and I had 13 of their studios under my portfolio and purview. And I really enjoyed helping those studios build their HR culture and ensure that best practices were um, really followed in their, as they were building and growing in their studio um, cultures. So... Uh, fantastic experience working in all across North America, England, Australia, and some studios in Europe, which was really great. Um, when I left THQ, I began my career with Nexon. Um, and I'm, that was a very interesting two-year experience for me, so I know there's a couple of people in my Nexon career in the audience, so I'm really happy to see them. Um, when I was with Nexon, we were we were uh, there for two years, and we were named number five on the 100 best companies to work for in British Columbia. So that was a really enormous achievement for, from an HR perspective. Um, unfortunately, to the economic collapse at that time, we were shut down. So it was, a, from an HR perspective, that's also, unfortunately, a really tragic thing to go through as a studio, but it's something that an HR professional has to deal with. and. Um, it's a, a learning experience that we all go through, and uh, you know you come through the other side much more broad from a broad perspective. So I went to Warner Brothers from there, and working for a multinational is something that all of us sort of aspire to do, I think, at some point in our career. But it's not always the best fit. It certainly wasn't for me, and I really. Uh, enjoyed working for a more intimate and dynamic studio, so I went back to Nexon. And so here I am back at Nexon. We have 3,000 global employees. We are in Asia, all over Asia, China, Japan, Korea, Europe, and North America. We have 240 employees in our El Segundo studio. Um, and I'm really interested in sharing all of the cultural advances, our progressive HR policies, and the things that we're trying to do to make our culture in our El Segundo studio a high-performance culture. So I'm really happy to be here. Well, why don't we start right there? Um, I mean, there's lots of different metrics, whether it be sales or meeting deadlines or getting paid by the publisher or, or number of hours worked. How do you define high performance inside your studios? And I guess we'll start back with you because you brought up the topic. Yeah. Well, I think that's an interesting um, question. So high performance is really something that gets bandied about quite a bit, you know, what it defines a high performance culture. I would tell you that our people define our high performance culture. Um, how, whether or not our people are engaged, whether or not they feel, um, you know, welcome in our studio, whether our, our products are delivered on time, how we engage with our clients, um, whether or not our, our uh, what kind of feedback we're getting from our, our studio population, whether they feel like they have a collaborative working relationship with our, our organization, our leaders, you know, whether it's a two-way street basically back and forth, um, whether our targets are being met on time, our milestones are being met on time, it's not just a financial component to, um, it's not a financial transaction. High performance does not equal financial tra transaction. What do you guys think? 
I would echo that as far as production and what we turn out as a development studio, what our product is and what that represents in the business that we're in. But in the experience specifically of taking going from a THQ type of culture, because we're here in Southern California, so we were very close to the corporate office, we kind of adopted those policies, practices, and those types of environments because THQ, we also produced our product for THQ. So there was that line in, as part of that infrastructure. In the last, you know, a little over two years now, we've been going through different phases of transition to understand what high performance means for us as an independent developer. And that is still evolving and shaping. And what we're encountering are things, you know, the needs, as you say, Paula, you know, for feedback and continuous communication and the interaction in coming up with what do we want in our culture. And so what I have been focusing on are values. What are the values? And let's start with that and then the behaviors that we can expect and we want to look for in how people are going to conduct themselves and that will largely support the culture that we'll be evolving in. I, w I would agree with that um, sentiment with regard to Lynn and you know, being a newer studio, um, we are still in those those phases, you know, we've been in business for 10 months and what, what is working and what's not, but I think the most important thing for us uh, has always been to make sure that we hire extremely talented people and, you know, part of that is, you know, being an attractive employer and having really great practices such as, as Paula mentioned, being a collaborative studio and working on great IP. Um, but, you know, the retention piece, I think, is something that sometimes gets overlooked and, you know, it's kind of like once people are in the door, um, you know, we just have a deadline. We have to get this out by a certain date. And sometimes we forget the people piece, whereas in the recruitment aspect, we're cheerleaders for our studio and how great we are and come on board. Um, but the retention piece is really important. And so high performance for us is there is no silver bullet. Um, I think there is a number of different... Uh, aspects, as, as Paula had noted, you know, the kind of culture that you're creating and important, very important for us is the feedback loop and the mechanism. And being a small studio, our employees really enjoy the fact that there's not a lot of bureaucracy and they actually have a voice that's heard and validated. It doesn't necessarily mean that every idea they have is incorporated in the game, but, um, you know, really feeling like they're part of our business and, and driving us forward. And because of that, I think that they're very invested and um, for the success of the studio and for their own uh, professional growth. So sorry, my cell phone is going off because I, I can make this PSA right now. If your cell phone's on, please turn it off. <laughs> um, be quiet now. Um, I guess I'm not going to say anything new or revolutionary in, in uh, comparison to my counterparts. Um, the big aspect for Insomniac, I think, is collaboration. Um, when I look at our, our culture, our environment, and what we value, um, I think that being able to change and accept that change is very important in our particular studio. We've had different mission statements or vision statements and we've talked about you know efficiency or effectiveness and at the end of the day um, for us today it is that everyone has a say and that is really true at Insomniac um, that we deliver on time every time because that's something that we stand behind as a studio um, and that we try and do better every single time we make a game. And so from an HR perspective, one of the things that we focus on so highly in trying to create this high performance culture is getting rid of all of the ancillary items um, behind the scenes. We want to make you feel warm and welcome and not worry about anything besides what you're doing. Um, and it's a constantly evolving process for us. Um, if, I, if I had any sort of advice to anyone out there, it is ask. Ask questions and encourage the feedback. Um, Paula was talking about um, receiving awards, and Insomniac is also known 
um, for having received a lot of best workplace awards. And it's great to be on those lists, and it's meaningful, especially when you're in HR. But what's behind those lists are surveys and true feelings um, from our employees that, quite honestly, sometimes they're afraid to share, even if we encourage that, that open communication. Um, what we try and do is talk to every single employee, and it, it typically takes me about a year to go through the entire studio and sit one-on-one -on -one with everyone, but it's asking, you know, what do you, what do you love about this place? What keeps you here? What would you change? If you could change one thing, what would it be? But you also can't stop there. You have to then communicate what it is that that you're doing about it, and if you can do something about it, and if it's just not on the, the top five list at any particular point in time, you know, in the near future. And all of those things and actually acting upon them are what I think drive a high performance culture for us. So you're sort of led into my next question, which is, I mean, how is HR viewed by employees in your student, and, and how do you strategically affect the company? Like, how do you guys, how do you affect you know, this drive towards high performance. Do you want to start, Lynn, or you want me to? I, you can start right there. Okay, you start well, it. You start it. Right we'll yeah, exactly. Zigzag, Serpentine right days, yes. <laughs> we <laughs> um, well, I think we were actually talking right outside um, earlier about um, about HR and, and our particular studios. And for all of us, I think, up here, we're – we don't shy away from anything. We're very much right in the thick of things within our studio, and we try and understand the processes. We understand the challenges that our employees face or our, our management faces, and we don't hide in a back office. Um, we, we are the promoters of culture. We are not administrators or, or the police, so to speak. And I think that um, that feeds a lot. If you have a a strong relationship um, with everyone in your studio, then you have the ability to to take their feedback and and act on it. So, so for us, everything that we do, the first question that we ask is, how does this impact our employees? And I could give you an example of something that's sort of very boring in HR, but it, it's, it's benefits, right? So the cost of benefits go up and they're skyrocketing and that cost gets pushed back to employees. And we have an industry that is sort of known for having really cool benefits. Um, the first, before we make any change, the first question that we ask is how will this imp impact our employees? And we may not choose the most, um, financially beneficial choice for insomniac. We may choose the most financially beneficial choice that will help our employees and help their families. And that's a fundamental difference, I think, and we're just, we're lucky that we can do that. Um, so to answer uh, your first question, Gordon, I think um, the biggest thing with being creating a culture that's high performance is really having trust with the employees. And to Carrie's point, having HR executives who are very engaged with the population, um, I think, you know, HR maybe years ago was kind of the paper pushers and the police and they took care of you for orientation and they sent you on your way to the world. Um, and I think the evolution of human resources is that very successful organizations understand that there has to be a very close relationship. HR has to have a seat at the table in your organization to be successful. And strategically, it's trust with the executive level and it's also trust with the employees. And HR plays a delicate balance at times with that because at the end of the day, you know, you have to make money and at the same time too, you wanna to keep your employees happy and how do you keep that happy marriage? But having the trust of the executive team and being very close and having that buy-in, I think, is really, really, really important because you can be the greatest HR professional in the world and work in an organization where people are not valued at the upper levels and you really have no impact. It's probably very unlikely that you will ever make an impact in the organization and make 
that organization be an employer of choice. And so I would say for those of you in the room right now who are in executive positions and you have the opportunity to partner with HR, um, go back to your studios and make it happen. That is something that's really fun in the last two years at Heavy Iron because we've actually kind of, I guess you could say, a company-wide focus group something like that, where we've actually tried a couple of different things in benefit-type policies and practices, and one of them, I, I loved the fact that our president was really kind of spearheading it. I kind of had to play devil's advocate a little bit to have a sick time policy that was very organic and basically, without boring you with all the details, it was if you're sick and you need to stay home or you have a family member that's sick and you need to stay home with them, then please do so. And there was no cap on the number of days. There was no award of time. There was no hour value or dollar value to that time. Well, as we, you know, guessed and suspected, there was less than 1% of the people in our population that abused that, and it was not a surprise, you know, of that group, because that's kind of how that happens, right, in a group of people. And then there were the people that had previously used all their sick time when it was a specific number of hours, and they didn't use any. So it was very interesting case study, so to speak, but I loved the fact that the management team was open to trying something like that, seeing what the result was, and experiencing that as a studio, because what we wanted to do, as we've already, as we've been saying, is to provide the value to the employees. And hopefully they'll manage it well, because that's one thing as the executives and the management team of the, of the studio make those kinds of decisions, and there is an expectation that then the employees will honor that and they will get the value out of it. So it kind of becomes a two-way street, and I think that's important for management and executives to understand, that if you put some things out there, we have an expectation somewhat of what might happen or how it might happen or whatnot because we have to be fiscally responsible in all of those applications. So it's just an, it was an interesting experience last year, but I would say that too, that uh, human resources is very strategic in modeling those things and coming up with and developing the ideas and the practices and so forth that are going to contribute to the culture overall and the success of the studio. So just to kind of add, I think that what you're hearing from very strong HR people here is the progressive push toward high performance. So you're not what you're not seeing here is people that are sitting back and letting culture just organically develop. You're seeing people that are being strategic thinkers and pushers and drivers toward high performance. And when you have a strong strategic thinker in an HR leadership position, then the culture that is driven toward high performance will move forward at a much more rapid rate. And you'll get a more progressive more progressive HR practices, more progressive HR procedures, your, um, your employees will develop at a higher rate. All of the culture will be a, a more high-performing culture, and that's why a strong HR professional group is a, is a contributor toward uh, a high-performance culture. I think um, when you have strong strategic thinking in an HR department, um, you, you just have a, a true partnership between, certainly at the C level, and an HR department like this. That's that's why you want this true partnership at that level. Very cool. So now this question is, is multiple parts to it, but it's sort of layered. Uh, the, the question is this: it's, it's how does your studio define and deal with crunch? Um, is the definition the same for all workers, those new to the industry, veteran non-managers, managers, leads, and executives? And how do you prioritize that amongst the challenges to be mitigated in your studios? Oh, I'll go again. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, wow. Um, how do we deal and define with uh, define crunch? Um, so I'm just going to—I hate that word. I really do. Um, I'm, but I know it exists. Um, 
Here, here's my plea to everyone. It, it takes a village. Um, at, the t- at the top, um, we can espouse all kinds of stuff. We're going to control scope. Um, we're go- and, and we've done things in our studio like adding in production management, um, stretching out the production schedule um, from two years to three years, all in the effort to reduce crunch. And I think it takes time. If I look at the series of our games and where we were almost a decade ago to where we are now, it's a very different place. Um, but this is a very passionate industry um, with with people that hopefully care about what they're putting out there and they're putting their name on it. And so you have this constant balance or dynamic going on where with artists, art is never done, right? And design wants to you make sure that it's fun. And so when I say it takes a village, um, it has to be from the bottom up that people want to step up and say, okay, you said we're going to control scope. This is how I see that we're going to do this. You want me You want me to work on this piece? Well, then what are we going to take away? And it's truly understanding every single aspect of your pipeline and how those interdependencies work with other departments because you may end up where, great, we got everything done, but then another department is suffering. So the more that people band together and and try and address it, I believe that you see less crunch. But uh, Do you guys see it actually tied to like a heart? Is there a definition, like whether there, is there a moment where there's like an awareness, like on an on off switch ish we're like okay this feels crunchy <laughs> this feels crunchy i think that i think um i think it's a reality that um we don't have eight hour a day jobs um maybe mm-hmm. we have 10 12 hour a day jobs depending on what we're working on it starts to feel crunchy to me if you um feel like you're missing out on the rest of your life um if you have to work all week and a weekend and into the next week, that starts to feel crunchy, and that seems to me like somebody needs to step up and say no. I I think we also have to accept that depending on where you are in your career, if you are new to the industry, if you are just out of college, if you are super psyched about something, chances are you're going to work crazy hours. And I've seen an insomniac that as people get married, have babies, realize that there's a life outside of work, they start to step up and say, hey, wait a minute, I have something else that's more important in my life. And I applaud them because then they become our ambassadors of trying to make production um, less crunchy. Mm -hmm. And I'll also say that, you know, interestingly, over the last several years, studios are taking a shift. So, so there, are, there has definitely been a shift. Maybe the shift isn't happening as fast as some would like to see it. But, you know, the basketball, the basketball courts are becoming less used because people are going home and playing basketball at home. The cafeterias aren't sort of serving free dinner so often because people are actually eating at home. The babysitting services aren't happening so often because people are going home. Mm-hmm. You know, those kinds of practices are becoming less and less prevalent. So I think the industry is slowly recognizing that it, it is regulating itself. Um, but I think, you know, we can also define we can also help to shift that that work-life balance. Some, that's a term I'm not a big fan of at all, but I haven't heard a better one yet. Um, but, but internal pressure can also help to move that. Um, but I think, you know, when you look across industries, lots of industries go through periods of time where, where they have internal periods that, that they would call crunches, you know, tax time for accountants, tourism time during Christmas. There's lots of different things where, where they have, you know, where we are often not the only special industry that goes through these types of periods. Um, but we definitely have something that we need to look at from an internal perspective. And, and I think, you know, we can fix it from the outside, but, but we can also shift it from the inside. So I think, um, I think that's something that we can also work on like carries us as a village. Go ahead. Ladies first. (laughs) Go for it. I said ladies first. Well, well, I'll jump in with a follow-up question. So, I mean, obviously you are senior executives fully sort of invested in attacking these issues internally from your studios. Maybe, I guess people out here might wonder, are there resources 
that people can bring to the fore at locations where they might not have you or you or you sort of, you know, guiding this culture in this way? Like, how can, you know, people affect change where they are when you're not there? Well, now we're stuck. No. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you have to want it yeah. as an organization. Yeah. Yeah. And if you don't want it, then it's not going to happen. But if you want to retain your employees, if you want to have quality products and a good work environment and high-performing culture, then you have a responsibility and an obligation to figure out what that means for your group. And if what is happening isn't working and you're not addressing it, then that's another issue. I also think um, that there, there are a lot of resources out there, Gordon, to your point, uh, mm -hmm. whether it's, you know, IGDA and reaching out to all of the professionals within the IGDA through whether it's, you know, the HR SIG or, you know, some of the other resources in the forums. I also think um, each of us are all uh, a member of ESHRA, which is the Entertainment Software Human Resources Association. And if you ever have a need where you feel like you need to bounce something off of someone, I think anyone in that organization is more than happy because the goal of that organization is to advance the industry um, as an industry of choice and to really make us uh, you know, be something that people aspire to and it's very attractive for everybody. And therefore, we, we definitely want to espouse and share that because to Paula's point, um, it's, it is something that it's so important that you know you can you can have an HR person who's really driven, but if you don't have the management and vice versa, and having that magic mix and that puzzle of, of groupings of people in order to create a high performance culture. Yeah. Um, but knowing what resources you need sometimes just means you need to reach out and call someone. Well, well, and the support of your peers, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, you, you sort of talk about choice, and we I, I know that the term sort of employer of choice, and I think from far away, people think of employer of choice as, you make great games. Like, your games are great. You're an employer of choice. But is that actually how you define it in the world? Like, what does it mean to you, and what does it mean to your company, and, and what does it look like, like day to day? Like, I think people want sort of like a day to day, like for reals, like we're going to be a great place to work today. How, what sort of things affect that tactically, you know, that, that they should be taking home with them? Respect. Um, I mean, if, if there's anything, I think that uh, you, have to, you have to respect yourself. You have to respect the people that, that work for you, um, work with you. If, if that isn't there, then I think that you have a really ch a real challenge day to day. If I were to think about uh, Insomniac as an employer of choice, I, I think that we, we make a conscious effort every day to, to care about what's going on. We could choose to just, you know, grind through um, and, and we just actively, very consciously make a choice um, to, to do better. We know we can do better all the time. Amos? Um, I think it, I would say that it's about an employee, you know, maybe citing the boring stuff, but the things that we all read about. You know, HR studies over and over again talk about one of the most important factors, if not the most important, important factor for employee satisfaction, is their perception of their value to the organization and their contribution. And, and, that, though, has to be balanced with all the other aspects of culture because if you're adding incredible value but you're working 100 hours a week and, you know, all of a sudden your wife had a baby and you didn't know it um, <laughs> because it wasn't your child because you weren't home. <laughs> um, you know, those are all things that, that really make a... Um, I don't have any personal experience. But <laughs> uh, you know. But that being said, it's it's the value proposition. An employer of choice is where an employee chooses to stay with you, and 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 you can retain them not because you're dangling free dinners or a hefty bonus. Because while money is a motivator, and compensation packages and benefits and the things we talk about are important. At the end of the day, if the employee doesn't feel like they have a voice and if they don't feel like that they're valued and that they're actually contributing to the success of your studio, you have failed. And you need to figure out where it is. And maybe it could be, as much as we hate to say it, that there are times when that employee is not a good fit for your studio. And that's okay. Mm -hmm. Because the right studio or, or industry may be something else. 
But being able to have that conversation with employees to understand if they feel valued in the organization and understanding if that actually is coming through, it should, in your products and what you do on a daily basis. And that, to me, is, is what being an employer of choice means. In my other life in the staffing industry, when we were faced with a challenge of filling a position and the uh, operations people would say, well, let's pay them more, okay? That becomes, can become a philosophy. Can you fill a job quicker if you pay more? More than likely. Does it mean that it was the best hire you could make? Probably not. So to Amos's point, we can have a lot of things in place free dinners, massage Thursday, wine Wednesday, whatever the case may be. I want to be at your studio. Exactly. Well, I, I, I didn't mean to say that. Wine Wednesday. <laughs> Boy, talk about progressive. <laughs> so, I got to make a note, too. I was like, wine Wednesday. Wine. I'll call you guys. <laughs> I'll send you an invite. And so we, if you have all of those things, but like Amos said, if people don't feel value, like Carrie said, if they don't feel respected, just on a, on a regular basis, as an employee, as a human being, as a contributor to the studio, it won't constitute being an employer of choice. The other marker that I personally like is when I have X number of hires per year and 50% or more were made through referrals. That's my favorite marker. Um, I would also add everything that they said, which is all uh, great and uh, exactly true. But I would also add that the organization has to be a professional partnership with the employee. So the organization, from an HR perspective, has to have all of its ducks in a row. So you cannot be sloppy in your practices with the employee. You have to have proper career pathing, and you have to have good compensation structure. You have to have, you know, proper onboarding. You have to have, even if the employee leaves, you have to have proper exit practices. You know, your employee manual has to be proper. Everything has to be real professional um, practices. Because the, when an employee is going through their experience with your organization, it must be a professional business experience. They're not there doing you a favor, right? They're giving you their professional expertise. And as a business, your responsibility is to give them back your professional expertise. Um, there is nothing worse for an employee than to, to feel like they're there not getting the best of your expertise, that you don't have their career in your good hands. And if they feel like you don't have an understanding of where they should be going with their career, or you don't understand, they can't understand your bonus pr formula, or they don't understand where their, um, you know, the, anything that's going on in their experience, they will go somewhere else that gives them a better experience. So from an HR department, you must have your ducks in a row, and it must be a really good row. You must be good at your job. I know I've heard from many employees that have come through my path, you know, they just really didn't know what they were doing. And that cannot be their experience with you. You really have to know what you're doing. If you're going to walk your walk, you've got to talk your talk, and you have to have all your ducks in a row. So I would add to culture, especially at a high-performing culture, um, I would add to everything that they said, you must be good at your job. Uh, we must be good at our jobs. So that brings us back. I mean, besides Wine Wednesday, which is clearly genius. In addition to yeah. Wine okay. Wednesday. Well, well, let's talk about like so. What which I'm going to start, yeah. by yeah. the way. Yeah. Wine, yeah. wine weekday. Wine I weekday. Mean, yes. Yes. Sorry. Yes. Martini Monday. Yes. Take yeah. it up. Yes. What, We're all what, alcoholics. So, what programs and policies has your studio actually implemented in order to ensure high performance culture, um, including maybe the, the biggest surprise or disappointment with the programs that you implemented? We'll start right here. Sorry, we're starting with me. We'll start right there, yes. I, I have to think about disappointing um, results. Um, you know, when, you, when I actually was posed this question earlier, I started thinking about some of the things that really have to do more with production and, and some of the shifts that I've seen and, and things that 
help us be a more high-performing culture. Um, up until, I want to say last year, maybe 18 months ago, um, most of the people that were working on our games really never played the game um, throughout its cycle. Uh, they were just so focused. Um, and we implemented weekly play tests where we actually encouraged every single employee uh, every Friday for an hour or two um, we would we would have these very focused play tests, and then we, then we would create um, and, and this really came from the design team um, surveys, and they would collect that feedback, and then they would implement it into their next build. And when I think about um, high performing cultures, this is just an area where I think that we've seen success because we've always talked about being able to iterate. Um, Faster to be to be able to understand what is what is fun, what is that fun not fun, and let's not get all the way in, into alpha before we figure out. Oops, this game isn't fun. <laughs> um, so we're actually getting everyone um, that we can involved and responsible, and I see that you know as something that's that's a success. Um, we also used to have one project. Um, at a time, and it was much easier to communicate what was going on on the projects. But now we have multiple projects and um, multiple locations. And I know, um, like all, I mean, if you have 3,000 employees, you know, globally, talking to all of them and making sure they're all in the loop is a challenge. And so, a lot of, um, you know, the show and tells and things that we do just to keep people that aren't on a particular project involved um, and knowing what's going on, so that they can share tech that they can share assets, that they can think about things from, from a long-term perspective, I think makes a big difference. Those are things on the yeah. on the production side. Um, I'll, I'll think about a disappointing thing. I know there's got to be something. We, we'll, we, do we'll a lot of, we do a lot of you know, things that are disappointing. We'll too. come back around. So. Hey, Amos, what do you got? Um, I, I think, you know, similar to Heavy Iron, um, one of the things that we're most proud of at our studio, you know, we, when we started the studio, uh, certainly, I came with a lot of uh, experience at a variety of different studios and entertainment companies, and uh, you know, learned a lot of best practices and what we should do. And um, you know, we have a similar policy at Hidden Variable where we have no PTO. Uh, essentially, we expect people to be adults, and we treat them with independence and autonomy to make good decisions for the that's mutually beneficial, and also, you know. They get what they need, and we get what we need. Um, it doesn't mean that you can wake up and you know, had a hangover because you were hanging out with friends and playing World of Warcraft till four in the morning, um, and then just call in sick and like be like, "Sorry, dude, I'm like not feeling so well." Um, that just is not realistic. I mean, we manage that similar to as Lynn mentioned, where you have a small percentage of the population that you have to do. But I don't believe in having uh, policies that, you know, sometimes I've worked in organizations where you have a small group of people that may not be doing something or doing something that's less ideal or not in the best interest of the studio, and then they, uh, you know, a, uh, there's a company-wide decision to execute a policy, you know, because of those few people. I don't believe in punishing the masses for the crimes of the few, as, um, as I, I said in our studio and our part, my partners probably hate me for. But um, the PTO was one of them. I think one of the disappointments I would share uh, was an experience in which, uh, as a studio, I was working, and we thought that we had traditionally given people a number of very limited choices um, for their health care benefits. And as health care costs rise, that is always the pressure that's put on HR, is how do you keep your employees happy? How do you offer great benefits? And yet, at the same time, to balance the fact that you now have a 14% increase, which with a studio of you know 200 or 3,000 or even six is a huge amount. Mm -hmm. um, and we actually offered more. We thought we thought the more choices we offered to employees for them to actually make their own decisions about what plans offer them. And we were going to essentially have, if you have this plan, it'll be paid for by the company. If you want anything more than that, you would have to pay for it through a prepaid. Uh, uh, pre-tax deduction. And that being said, um, what we hadn't forecasted and what we hadn't planned for and what I had not really anticipated was it was overwhelming. Having all of these choices of benefit plans was something that the employees 
couldn't deal with. They, we had, I had failed as an HR professional in anticipating that need that they needed to really be educated about all of the different choices because most of the time people will, you know, I think us as an industry, we probably offer really, really great benefits and we offer a large variety of benefits, but there are employers out there that say, you can pick this HMO and this PPO and that's it. And you can pick this vision plan and that vision plan and that's it. Um, and so that, dis that was a disappointment, I think, for me and a learning experience in my professional career of really trying to think of um, and anticipating the needs and certainly uh, learn from that going forward. So, One of the successes that we've had since we went um, independent was that we were able to put together a comparable benefits package as the employees had experienced with THQ. That was interesting to manage. I had l barely two months to do it. Um, and have everything effective on the first day of the new entity, but we did it. And we were you know, concerned that if we didn't have something that people felt confident with and that the new company, the new entity, was willing to put in place for them, that people would really begin to leave you know, pretty quickly. Um, so that was a success. Our um, sick time program last year was a bit of a disappointment because we didn't punish the masses, but what we did say was, you know what, we didn't see the value. Overall, we didn't see the value, so we're doing this. So we did kind of a hybrid of, of you know, an award of time, but um, not an unlimited. So we kind of balanced that out. So that was a little bit of a disappointment to us, and I think we were thinking, you know, wow, this is so progressive, this is so cool, everybody's gonna really do well with it. Well, not so much. Um, and then another success was that um, also in separating from THQ, we, I had the opportunity to begin to evolve our performance management process. And no one, no one was happy with what they had been working with. And of course, they're not happy because they have to do it, right? Uh, we understand that. So the first round, uh, we had 100% turn everything in and complete the process. That was very exciting. And I changed it from goals and task lists to value-based behaviors and expectations, and it worked. So that was really cool. So this time, um, it's evolving again, and that was through my going around and meeting with people, with leads, with department heads, and again, we're small enough now that we can play with these things and get what's going, put in place what's going to give us the most value on an individual basis as well as an organization. So those, I, that is a partial success. I hope it will be again this year. Um, I think uh, an interesting success that we've had, so Nexon's going through a lot of transition right now. Um, the structure of our organization has been, um, we've gone through a, a big restructure and it's we're, we're going through a very interesting time. So one of the successes that we've had recently has been we put in place a employee advisory group to advise HR, to work with me directly uh, and my senior level generalist. And uh, I sent out a, a call to all of my directors, the directors, the heads of all of my departments, and I said, who are your influencers in your departments? Who are the people that are not your most senior people? I'm not looking for the heads of your, your leads or your sort of most senior people, but who are the people who are the loudest talkers? Who are, who are the people that are the influencers in your department? Um, the most charismatic, who are the leads, who, who are your influencers um, in good standing, who are those people? And I got back this really dynamic list of people and I got them all together in a room and I said, okay, you can, you know, there's the door, you've got 10 minutes to leave, um, here's what I want from you. I want, you know, you have a carte blanche to go at the end of my spiel, but if you're going to stay, then commit yourselves to me for one year. And if you can commit yourselves to me for one year, I'm going to be rolling out. You're going to all have HR fatigue at the end of this year. But I'm going to be rolling out an enormous amount of HR revamped HR stuff, like new, new performance review, new compensation structure, new all kinds of new stuff. Um, and I, want, I just want your opinion on it. It's all confidential. You have to keep it confidential. Um, but I would just want your thoughts. I want your opinion. I want your feedback. Um, nobody left, which was really great. I was really happy. And uh, they've, they've stuck with me 
and they have been the most interesting feedback, sort of contained feedback group that I've been able to work with. And it's really benefited me on two ways. One, if it's not a popular program that we've rolled out, they are kind of going to be the leads that'll go, no, no, you're really going to like it. Because they've actually participated in the feedback sessions and th to actually roll out that program. So, so they're going to be the influencers for their groups. But also, they've given us really strong opinions on how to tweak it and make it positive to roll out across our organization. So, um, so that's been a really big success, and they've really helped us roll out positive stuff across our, our groups. Um, some disappointments. Um, I would tell you some of my biggest disappointments have often, and I'll just be super candid with you, have often been with the leadership in my organizations. And I would tell you that across all of the organizations I've worked with in my career, Sometimes I, I have been disappointed with the, the, the top leaderships that I've um, worked with where I will, uh, you know, I, I think, I don't want to speak for everybody, but I think you get direction or you get agreements and then once you're about to roll, they'll change their minds. Or they'll want to go in a different direction or they'll, something will happen and they won't, you know, and sometimes that can be very difficult for, uh, for HR. So for me, that's often been a big disappointment. That's a, that's a tough one because you're ready to go and you have agreements and you're set and you're about to go and they'll go, ah, it's too uncomfortable, I don't want to do it. So that can be, uh, that can be a big disappointment. Okay. Well, I want to make sure we save lots of time for Q&A. So let me sort of accelerate through these, these questions, which is for sure, collectively, what three suggestions would you give to the audience and the world on the Internet to ensure that, that they walk away with action items that they can implement in their own studio to create high performance culture. We'll start, we'll go back there. We'll start from China. Go back, back over there. Yeah. That's me? Yeah. Um, my three suggestions would be to really pay attention all the time to what's going on in your studio. Keep your eyes open, listen, pay lots of attention. Don't sit in your office, get out there. Get off your phone, get away from your computer, and pay attention. You'll find out a lot more about what's actually happening. Take the pulse of your own organization. Um, don't, just, don't just rely on the people in, in your department to tell you what's actually happening. Um, two, don't be afraid to act. So uh, don't hum and haw. Take action. Do something. Don't just sit there. Take action and don't be afraid to, to make change. But three, don't be afraid to change your mind. If you've made a mistake, say it, change it, fix it. Don't just sit in the mistake that you've made because you've made that decision. Change your mind. Mistakes can be fixed. Just admit it, fix it, change it. My three suggestions. Lynn. My three suggestions are to get and make sure that you stay connected to the people. If you're not, you're missing it. Um, either in executive or production or human resources or whatever the application is, generate programs and practices that have results in terms of value to the employee, to the team, to the company, and the, all of those things will roll up and affect the business and the success of the business. And also to really try to avoid making decisions in a vacuum and isolating yourself, be it by your role or the decision that you are in the process of making, by isolating it and not keeping it real. And again, that speaks to staying connected to your people. So those were my three suggestions. There seems to be a trend here <laughs> amongst us. Um, I think that the number one thing for me is, is to be able to listen and to engage your people, know the temperature of your studio, understand what's going on. People may put on a happy face, but they're grumbling in the kitchen about you. You know, there is an issue. And, and the more that you are engaged with your employees and your direct reports, it creates a mutual trust and they will confide in you and you will understand what makes them tick. You will know that maybe they're in the wrong position and with a change they're going to excel. 
Um, so listen and engage your population. And if you walk away with nothing today from um, me, and I think we all have agreed as a panel, is you know go back to your studios and start that engagement process if you already don't have it. I think um, the second thing would be be open to change. And, and it's okay to be afraid that you don't know what the circumstances are. But to Paula's point, you know, mistakes happen. And you can change it back or you can tweak it. And if you are bound by fear that, you know, this may not work, you'll never know if it could work. And I think the last thing is, as leaders in this room, if you want to create a great culture, you need to model that culture and you need to walk the walk. Um, and think about that every day when you're having a situation in the studio that's difficult. Do you lose your cool and start acting frantic and running around the office? Or how do you handle that? Because as much as you may not think of it, as leaders, you know, an analogy is, you know, parents and children, you know, children will, will grow up to be the parent, you know, the adults that their parents are. They will, they will emulate that behavior. And so as leaders in an organization, I think, you know, it requires some introspection, but, you know, look back and say, like, how am I perceived in, in, in my studio and in my role? Wow, I really have nothing new to add. I mean, we, we <laughs> there's a reason why <laughs> we're doing what we're doing. I mean, the notes that I have are, are virtually the same. Um, you know, my big takeaway would be that you spend time talking to everyone, and it's not just talking to everyone, but it's listening to everyone. Um, it, the other thing is uh, choosing, choosing the big issue that you want to, you know, take a bite out of um, because if you if you take it all on at once um, then you just have little pieces that continue to falter so by by engaging your entire work um, your workforce you find out really what is the thing that's bubbling to the top um, and then you tackle that and don't forget to tell everyone what it is you're doing about it and what you're not doing about it. Because more often than not, I hear, um, well, I just, you know, I, I made this suggestion, um, but then nothing happened. And it may not be that nothing happened. It just may not be that it's the critical issue um, of the day. Um, uh, or it wasn't communicated. Exactly, it wasn't communicated. Um, and, and the other thing that I would say is exactly what Amos says, which is, you you do need to you do need to walk the walk. Um, I see more in our particular environment, based on the behavior of all of the senior um, department heads, and how that impacts everyone else more than anything. And you know, my story would be that when I started Insomniac, the first week I was there, actually the first day I was there, um, Ted Price, our CEO, was sleeping on his couch. Um, that morning. He had a meeting. I knocked on his door. He was on the couch. And I, I was like, oh, what, what have I gotten myself into? <laughs> you know, and um, he quickly got up. But I've, I've seen uh, him from the top down make a change where, no, I'm not going to work late and sleep on the couch. No, I'm going to actually go home. I'm going to spend time with my family. No, I'm going to make the choice to work. To, to work during the week and not work on the weekend. And it's those things where you put it out there that people will start to see that it's okay. You, you, the expectation is not that you're there seven days a week. But if you're there, guess what? They're going to be there.